we've, we've already had our introduction to integrating economic and security issues, and we're now going to hear from, I think it's safe to say, historic Secretary of Treasury, uh, first head of the National Economic Council. His unparalleled knowledge of capital markets certainly paid off while he was in that uh, uh, position, and uh, his, his role in uh, moving us towards a balanced budget and a, a surplus and then from a position of economic strength dealing with, with the global uh, economic crises that came first in Mexico and Asia and, and then in Russia. His career at Goldman Sachs uh, led him to the eventual co-chair. He's now uh, chairman of the executive committee of a merged organization, Citigroup. And uh, so we, we turn to you, Bob. How do we better integrate our strategic approach into the financial uh, considerations uh, on down to, let me just say, the, 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 the walling off that Treasury frequently feels it needs not to be polluted. It has great resonance on Capitol Hill, and that, that makes it more difficult in this uh, uh, coordination. But what are your views on these issues that we've been discussing and moving for better that integration and contingency planning? Thank you, David. As Tony referred to the possibility of some of our staff members were schizoid. I think, Tony, their view was more the directors were schizoid. But in any event, <laughs> uh, when President Clinton first asked me to be the head of the new NEC, I came to Washington. I spent about a week here with the yellow pad, and I walked around Washington talking to different – I'd never been in the White House. I was there once, actually. I was invited to – contribute money to something. But in any event, <laughs> under, under Republican administration, oddly, but in any event, <laughs> but I didn't get to sleep there. No, but that's not the point. <laughs> that's not the point. Uh, I, I wandered around uh, Washington for a week with the yellow pad because I figured I'd better talk to people who've actually been in this place or I'm not going to know what the hell to do. And maybe I didn't know what to do, but at least I, I, I tried to learn. And clearly the most valuable person I spoke to was Brent Scowcroft. And, uh, Brent was nice enough. I'd never met Brent before. He was nice enough to see me. And then I think he spent almost an hour and a half with me. He scared the hell out of me because he told me he worked 90 hours a week. And I called my wife and I said, how do I get out of this job? <laughs> but that aside, uh, that aside, when you heard his description of what a national security advisor should do, it seemed to me it's a pretty good description of what a national economic council director should do. And working with Tony was a pleasure. We, a lot of things depend on structure, but a lot of things depend on personalities and how people work together. And uh, our thing did work well, Tony. I think it worked very well, except when we disagreed and when you prevailed, and then it didn't work well. <laughs> <laughs> Any event, I was asked to respond to, to four questions, and I think I'd like to do is just read them to you. And you'll see the three of them de deal with process, and then one of them deal with uh, what are the economic issues we should, uh, we, should look for, we should look to going forward. And with respect to the process questions, I think the best answer I can give you it's to describe what we did in the Clinton administration, because I actually think that we did have a, a good set. I agree with Tony. I think we did have a good set of processes and one that worked, worked pretty well. The four questions were, oh, and I might add that the processes we put in place, as, as I'll just say in a moment, were very much influenced and very consciously by the president, by the respect he had for the foreign policy processes of the, of the predecessor of Bush administration. The four questions were, how can the president ensure that economic issues receive the priority they deserve relative traditional security issues. Two, how are economic and security objectives and policies most effectively integrated? Uh, three, what is the role of the National Security Advisor and Council staff in coordinating economic and non-economic issues of security? And four, what are the principal economic challenges facing the new administration? Uh, let me also say that I, I think this question of, of how you integrate economic and non-economic issues that relate to international matters is indeed one an enormously worthy of focus. And it was interesting seeing yesterday's New York Times and today's uh, Financial Times, the discussions that the new administration is beginning to have about, about this subject. As David said, I was in the White House for two and a half years at Treasury for four and a half. And it was a time of, of enormous activity. And a lot of that activity was of momentous importance. You had NAFTA, GATT, uh, China WTO. We had a Mexican financial crisis, an Asian financial crisis, all the issues around Russia, the countries transitioning to communism. We had uh, one set of events with respect to the dollar that came, at the time at least, was described as a quasi-dollar crisis. We had the launching of the euro. We had the enormous increases in the uh, trade deficits with, with Japan and, and with China. 
an enormous, uh, I, I might add, a, a economically troubled Japan and China, and a great deal else. And during that entire time, the, the integration of economic and non-economic considerations, traditional foreign policy, national security, geopolitical considerations, were done in accordance with a very conscious and very deliberate management strategy that President Clinton had developed before he came to office. As I said a moment ago, it was one that was very much influenced by his respect for the processes in the Bush administration with respect to foreign policy and the way they worked. I remember my first interview, actually my only interview, with President Clinton during the transition. It was about a two-hour discussion. We talked actually very little about economic issues. We talked a lot about how people work together. And what he said was that the Bush foreign policy team managed to work together, at least it was his impression, in such a way that you had real teamwork, that when an issue came up, you had all the relevant parties at the table, that you had somebody at the head of that table who viewed himself as an honest broker, and that all, as a consequence, all the pros and cons of each issue, of each possibility came to the fore, and then you could make a, a balanced judgment that was best informed by all relevant considerations. And that's what he wanted to do, was to take that same model and apply it to the economic issues. And it was out of that that the, that the organization subsequently called National Economic Council came. Secondly, he said he thought that in this world that we were now in, that with respect to international issues that had an economic component, it was very important the economic issues, or the economic considerations rather, be given a weight that was appropriate and not be subordinated, as he felt sometimes had been the case, to national security, geopolitical, other non-economic foreign policy considerations. And that was partly because of the, the, enormous, the, the enormous increase in the importance of international economic issues to our own economic <coughs> well-being, and partly because the resolution Bye, Ben. <laughs> 1992 all over again. Any of it. Uh, and that was, that was partly because in many cases, for example, financial crisis, in order to get the, the geopolitics and, and the geopolitical objectives and national security objectives accomplished, you've also got to accomplish economic objectives. And I, I think this thing basically, I think the concept was right, and I think it fundamentally worked very well. Obviously, uh, each specific matter that developed would raise specific questions of process and, and what, which agencies were going to play what role and, and those you had to work out, but you did it within the structure uh, that I just described. Very importantly, during the transition, uh, I was sitting with my internet, with the de deputy for international activities, Bo Cutter at the NEC, and we got a call from Tony Lake and Sandy Berger. And they suggested, as Tony said, that instead of having separate economic staffs in the NEC and the NSC, which would then work with each other, hopefully, <laughs> we have a single staff of the international economic people, and that they would report jointly to the NSC and the NEC. And that, it seemed to me, was the final piece in the structure, and a very, very good idea, which we adopted, and that was the structure that uh, was in place then through the, the whole eight years. I think for this whole thing to work, it is also very important as Brent uh, emphasized, that the White House counsels play their appropriate role, which is a role of integration, uh, of honest brokering, but that it, the counsels not try to reinvent the agencies inside of the White House. And that doesn't mean that a national economic director to take the job I had or a national security advisor can't have strong opinions and express strong opinions. I believe they can, but I think it's got to be in the context of a process as, as Brent emphasized, that is recognized by all of the agencies concerned as a fair process. And it's got to be in the context of a process in which it is clear to everybody that the director's views, even if expressed strongly, will be presented no more strongly, or let me put it differently, will be presented fairly in addition to everybody else's views being presented fairly to the president. If people feel that way, then they'll respect the processes, and the processes will work. If they won't, then they'll end run it. Secondly, you've got to have a president who understands the importance of good process. I believe good process is critically important with respect to good policy, and who supports the process. And I can tell you that from the very beginning, President Clinton worked through his National Economic Council, and then on the international economic issues, the NAC and the NSC together, on economic issues. And in the instances when people tried to go around the processes, the president, uh, diplomatically but nevertheless firmly, referred them back to the processes. Well, it didn't take very long before people realized this was how business was going to get done, 
in our administration. Um, as to the decisions themselves, in some cases, it seems to me, the national security, the geopolitical, uh, the other traditional foreign policy considerations will have the predominant weight. And in other cases, the economic uh, considerations will have predominant weight. And then in some, they kind of balance out in an equal kind of a way. I'll state an example. This may be somewhat controversial, but at least it's my view. I think that when you have financial crises, as for example, we had in Mexico and then in Asia, in all likelihood, the economic considerations at least with respect to the, the structure and content of the response program, would appropriately have the predominant weight. Because if you can't reestablish credibility in the financial markets, then you won't solve the economic problem, or at least you won't have a reasonable chance, which is the best you ever have, of solving the economic problem. And if you don't solve the economic problem, then you're not going to be able to deal with the national security, geopolitical, and other problems. In trade issues, it, I think it's a very much more complicated question because very often in trying to accomplish, in, for example, with respect to trade enforcement, <laughs> in trying to accomplish a trade objective, you can have significant adverse uh, political or diplomatic effects. And there it's a very careful balancing and a weighing and a set of trade-offs. I think the key is to have processes that will enable whoever is going to make the ultimate decision, at least in our administration, they very often were made at the presidential level, see all the competing considerations on these very difficult trade issues where there very often were competing considerations, uh, particularly when you were talking about sanctions and enforcement. Uh, we had meetings that were very actively co-chaired co -chaired by the National Security Advisor and the Director of, of the National Economic Council. Uh, the uh, trade representative was the lead agency in terms of doing the analysis and presenting the material, but everybody had a strong had an opportunity to have an equally strong say. And of course, with respect to implementation, once the decision was made, uh, USTR was the lead agency. Finally, I think uh, all of this works or doesn't work depending on the atmosphere that a president creates in his administration. In the case of the administration now leaving, uh, President Clinton really did have a very strong sense of trying to create the kind of environment in which people would, to an extent practical, given human nature and its peculiarities, in which people would work together in a reasonably collegial and reasonably, mu reasonably mutual supportive way. I don't think there's any question that when he interviewed people for cabinet jobs and senior White House jobs, he was focused not only on their substantive expertise and their political savvy, but very much focused on whether he thought they would fit with other people. I know of one instance in particular where somebody who was being very seriously considered for a cabinet position, this was not the beginning, but a little further along the process, uh, didn't get the job because the president felt that that person had very sharp elbows and would, ups would not uh, fit into an environment in which people were trying to work in the manner that I have just described. Let me conclude by listing what I think, or at least some of, the principal international economic challenges facing the new administration. And I, I list them in no particular order, and undoubtedly I'm missing some. They're as important as any as that I've listed. Uh, when I think about markets and such matters, by the way, it always strikes me that what you try to do is you try to think of everything you, you can that would affect markets, and you always have to recognize the thing that's most important is probably something you, you never thought of, <laughs> which is why life is curious and dangerous. Well, it's not the only reason, but it's one reason. <laughs> <laughs> Any event, let me let me uh, I jotted down what struck me as some of the issues. Let me let me list them for you. One of them is continuing to promote trade liberalization. I I agree with Tony. Open markets. I I think our own open markets, our own open markets, contribute enormously to the economic conditions of the past eight years, and I think trade liberalization abroad and keeping our own open mar home markets open here should be a prime priority of a new administration. And I think that includes getting, to get very specific, getting either fast-track legislation or some uh, al uh, effective alternative to it. Secondly, is countering uh, the, in my view, exceedingly dangerous backlash against globalization, not only in this country but around the world. Increasing foreign aid to developing nations, which now buy something like 30 to 5 to 40 percent of our exports, and that includes uh, support for the World Bank, uh, the other 
the national development banks, the IMF, helping Russia and the other nations transitioning from communism. In some instances, I think in some of these cases, uh, I'm thinking Russia most specifically, we were faced with situations where all the choices were probably bad. In some sense, all the choices were very difficult. And so the point was to make the least difficult choice. But nevertheless, I think it's extremely important to be supportive with respect to these countries. Effective response to future international crises, in my view at least, given the way markets work, the inherent tendency that I at least believe exists in markets and economies to go to excess, I think it is virtually inevitable that we will have future international financial crises. And I think it is very important that we have effective response as well as, 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 well as prevention to the extent that that's possible. Uh, promoting a strong dollar, which is one of the maxims of our administration. We even said we, in, in the very same press release that we announced we were buying the yen in intervention, we also announced we favor a strong dollar, which I thought was quite a rhetorical accomplishment. But in any event, <laughs> and then when the press asked me, well, how can you say both? I say, well, that's because we believe in both. <laughs> and then finally, continuing to reform uh, the financial architecture. For me, uh, the six and a half years I spent in government, and many of you are far more experienced in government uh, than I have been, but it was really a remarkable experience. It was an opportunity to cope with the complex and I think in many ways unprecedented uh, problems of, of a new and complex global economy. I believe that the processes the President put in place contributed greatly to the successes we had, although we certainly had our, our failures as well. And I wish the new team the best as they now carry forward in, in dealing with this uh, complex world. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Bob. That excellent presentation. And now our final panelist is General Charles Boyd. Uh, he is a highly decorated Air Force officer, a prisoner of war from 1966 to 73. That makes you a hero in my book. <laughs> um, he is, has been executive director of the National Security Study Group, the Hart Rudman Commission, two and a half years of Blue Ribbon Commission that is looking at the strategic future. He himself is a strategic thinker and something of a, of a future. So. General Boyd. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I, uh, I, I think of myself as an old used fighter pilot, and I'm up here at a table uh, about to say something about national security with the likes of Tony Lake and, and Brent Scowcroft Candy, and uh, I have a comment or two about economics and uh, uh, with the highly respected and hugely successful Secretary of Treasury at showing arrogance on my part. I guess it's almost breathtaking. <laughs> uh, but nonetheless, uh, this is my task. I would tell you at the outset that uh, when, when uh, Dick asked me to participate, um, uh, the work that I'm going to talk to you about uh, was due to roll out for the public uh, uh, on the 10th, which was going to be well ahead of, of this conference. And then um, when that date got, got slipped to the 17th, uh, Dick and I talked about it, and, and, uh, and he said, well, you know, you're going to be on the panel about an hour before, you'll leave the panel an hour before the press conference in which the hart Redman Commission report rolls out, so you won't be upstaging your commissioners and uh, everything will be all right. And then uh, the United States Senate decided to hold uh, confirmation hearings for Colin Powell uh, at the same time we were going to roll our um, report out in the Mansfield room in the Senate, so we decided he might get more attention than we would, so we slipped that. And now I'm in the position of uh, um, upstaging my commissioners if I tell you, if I show you a little ankle uh, of what's in my report. but. Uh, uh, I'll deal with my commissioners later. I would ask you to, to, to take what I say uh, uh, in a private way and please uh, uh, <laughs> Sure. <laughs> um, uh, just in case you don't know, this, this Hart Redmond Commission, uh, established really by uh, uh, a discussion between uh, congressional leadership and this president, and designed to be a product that would be given as a gift uh, from this administration to the new. So its timing was uh, the work of the commission would be complete in time to hand over to, to, to a, a new national security team and a new president. 
bipartisan, scrupulously so, 14 commissioners, um, co-chaired by Gary Hart and Warren Redman, um, and consisting, as most of you know, I'm sure, of uh, a wonderful set of Americans, uh, ranging from Andrew Young and Newt Kingrich, uh, um, Ann Armstrong, Jim Schlesinger, a couple of military guys, uh, uh, Jack Galvin, Harry Train, uh, industry guy, uh, Norm Augustine, Don Rice, Les Gelb, uh, uh, just a truly uh, remarkable set of, uh, of uh, public servants and, and people who have been successful. In uh, some aspect of, uh, of the national security apparatus, backed up by a, a group of scholars and practitioners of the national security disciplines on the study group, uh, old military officers, uh, foreign service officers, intelligence officers, scholars, and the like. Three main things we were asked to do. One, define what kind of a world we think we're going to live in over the next quarter of a century, recognizing, as someone said earlier, nobody can predict the future, but you can take a look at some trends and maybe get some information or some draw some conclusions about what direction we're generally heading. We did that, and it's published, uh, New World Coming, I think a remarkable piece of work personally. But second of all, we were asked, taking uh, what we think we know about the world that we see emerging, what ought we do about it as a nation with respect to the national security? Um, um, what kind of national security interests do we now have? How are they defined in this world that we now live in? What should our objectives be? And, uh, and uh, what would be a strategy for the achievement of those national security objectives? We've done that, it's out, published. And the third phase, which is really the bulk of, of this document, which is about to go to the printer, um, take a look at the structures and the processes by which this nation formulates and executes its uh, uh, national security policies. Um, and is that structure, the architecture, um, is still adequate to the need, or might there be some readjustments that, uh, that you could recommend? Um, and so it is that, uh, that we have done that. Uh, quickly, by way of review, the world we saw coming was one in which, um, uh, in terms of uh, science and technology, uh, the rate of change was accelerating at a, at a breathtaking pace. The world is uh, changing um, in ways that uh, are hard for us to even grasp. Uh, Ninety some odd percent of the world, the, 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 the number of scientists that have lived in the course of human history are alive today. Um, all reinforcing each other and producing a synergism that, uh, that is just uh, breathtaking. Um, uh, the process of integrating uh, economics on a global basis is occurring uh, uh, also at a breathtaking pace. Um, and yet, at the same time, uh, a very large fraction of the world's people are, are not involved in that integrating mechanism. And as a result, um, a division between those who are and those who aren't is widening. And thus, maybe uh, the source of much of national security concern uh, over the next quarter of a century. Um, we were asked to look at our own, uh, our own nation, our, the, the changing nature of our own society and the implications for national security there. Um, I think most of us all look alike, the ones that sit on the panel, um, uh, unlike a very, very diverse uh, nation uh, that now we are becoming. Um, 83 languages spoken in the uh, Los Angeles County school system, 120 languages spoken right here in the public school system. Of, of uh, Montgomery County. This is a very diverse nation and getting more so very fast. And, uh, and what are the implications uh, uh, for, for the unity uh, of the country and its uh, identification with common uh, security objectives? Uh, very interesting. The uh, hardest part of our work, I will tell you, is the second part, uh, putting together a strategy, uh, defining the interests, defining our national security objectives. And, uh, and developing a strategy. Tony says that it, uh, it's tough to put together a, and maybe not even useful, uh, a, a large overarching strategy. Um, very, very tough. Um, and especially when you're dealing with uh, a, a group as diverse as our own commission with, with such a broad range of, uh, of ideological uh, inclinations. They did so. They debated themselves. This was a, this was a, a heavy lifting uh, organization. 
we set up a debate between uh, two of our most uh, skillful uh, um, in debating skills uh, commissioners and um, and they argued the merits of trying to develop a strategy that was weighted toward uh, opportunity and prevention or one uh, weighted toward response. Um, mostly we have experience with uh, a, a large strategy that deals with uh, with response or reaction. And indeed, as I think David mentioned, uh, the resource allocation process leans very heavily uh, today toward uh, the response tool, uh, the military, and uh, very lightly toward uh, uh, the opportunity or the, the prevention tool. Um, they came down clearly on the side of, uh, uh, of conflict prevention, of, of um, seizing opportunities, dealing with problem areas before they become crises, before they require the response tool. Um, and if there was, uh, in the end, uh, they were solidly in, in, in support of, of that notion. But that affects everything <laughs> uh, that you do after it. It reflects, reflects how you establish your priorities, how you allocate your resources to them, um, and the, the whole mechanism by which uh, this nation now formulates and executes is not geared in that direction. So it takes us naturally to the third um, and the structure and process part of the, uh, of the work, of the Commission's work, and I'll tell you about a couple of aspects of that, I think, that will that, that fit in the heart of what uh, 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 this conference is about. And then I'll stand ready to, to answer any specifics anybody has. One is that you can probably uh, uh, proceed without uh, a strategic framework, and you can probably uh, get along uh, in most circumstances by devising individual strategies as the need arises or managing crises as they emerge. But if you want to do, um, a, 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 in a largest sense, a conflict prevention kind of a strategy, um, you have to have a strategic framework for that. You have to do you have to do some strategic planning. There's, a, there's now an emphasis on that kind of a process that, uh, um, that we have not uh, really been accustomed to uh, 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 dealing with in, in recent decades. A I will tell you, I, I will jump ahead. After um, some time of developing um, this aspect of our study, um, I went back and, and read uh, uh, Waging Peace. I think Andy Goodpastor is allegedly here someplace in this audience. Um, he wrote the forward of the book. And it, I was uh, interested to note that Eisenhower seemed to have a systematic um, strategy formulation mechanism that uh, is, as far as I can tell, um, unmatched in the last half century by any administration, a truly um, systematic approach to re involving um, all the grown-ups. Uh, uh, we have in, in place now uh, a national security strategy development process. It's required by law, the Goldwater Nichols Law. We turn out a national security strategy every year, um, and it's done by um, action officers in the Pentagon and uh, some folks on the National Security Council staff, but as far as I can tell, nobody, at least in the military, above the grade of colonel ever reads it, uh, or even in some cases know its existence. Uh, an informal uh, uh, survey that I did with uh, some of my senior diplomatic friends uh, would indicate approximately the same is true in the State Department. So. A process that involved that is to have any real meaning and utility would have to be one like I think Eisenhower used in which uh, the principals actually uh, do the formulating of, of the strategy. Um, Andy in his forward mentions that uh, um, every Thursday was NSC day. Um, it's like the JCS uh, in the time when prior to Goldwater Nichols when the more important uh, um, the JCS process were underway. The, the, uh, if it was a Tuesday, or Wednesday, or a Friday, there was a JCS meeting, and it happened at 2 o'clock and everybody came. Uh, such a thing existed uh, at that time. So we call for 
the establishment of, and in some detail, um, a strategic uh, a strategy formulation process, uh, a, a prioritization, a strategic prioritization process, which produces um, a, a vehicle then that can go through OMB to the departments for uh, the allocation of resources uh, within those strategic priorities. The second big, uh, and I'm getting a note to get off the stage pretty quickly here, so I will, but uh, I think it's important out of the phase one report and reinforced in the strategy of phase two, this commission came down very firmly on the side that economics has become, uh, in case there's any doubt in anybody's mind, um, a component of national security at least equivalent to the military or the diplomatic component. And the, we are not structured in such a way to give recognition to that fact, nor to integrate in the processes um, all that, uh, that, uh, that kind of a decision implies. So um, this commission is calling for the, uh, uh, the President to, and the Congress to establish the Secretary of the Treasury as a statutory member of the National Security uh, Council. Um, uh, and a mechanism that would uh, no longer require a National Economic Council, the international uh, staff uh, would become an integrated part of the National Security Council staff, the that domestic peace would uh, become a part of the Domestic Policy Council. And um, um, they did so in recognition that the President can have anybody come to the principal's meeting if he wishes, but that uh, there was a certain symbolic value to uh, changing the law, the National Security Act itself, and that's the only uh, thing that uh, that I would. Uh, uh, one of my questions that uh, Dick Solomon asked me uh, to answer was, "Do we need a new National Security Act?" And the answer is no, but we need to tweak the one we have. I will stop right now, uh, lest I get my. Uh, Th th thank you very much, Chuck. Congratulations in your superb job in, in piloting uh, this commission through to its, its final destination today and hopefully uh, implementation. Our, our speakers have been so outstanding that we've, we've put more in, into their presentations. But let, let's have uh, some questions here and uh, we've got very little time. Please state your name, your question. Please don't give your answer. <laughs> yes, ma'am. I wonder if strategic. Uh, my name is Barbara Snell. Did you Barbara? The, the microphone back here. It's it's uh, he's he's moving it up to meet you. My name is Barbara Snelling, and uh, I'm from Vermont and uh, a new member of the uh, Peace Institute uh, board. And my question is, uh, given the very uh, intense political nature of our forthcoming Congress, uh, is it possible to have strategic thinking? Brent Scowcroft, you want to give a <laughs> succinct answer to that? Yeah. Yes or no? <laughs> well, we, we, we have expand more. We have very carefully avoided any discussion of the Congress, which is uh, a very important part of the process. Uh, and it is my humble view that the Congress is broke and needs to be fixed as more than the executive branch. That was very succinct. <laughs> <laughs> Who's next? Well, we've got a, a, a satisfying. I will turn this back to our uh, president. I want to thank you, gentlemen, for a really wonderful presentation. Again, thank you. An outstanding panel. We'll take uh, about a five, seven-minute break and uh, reconvene. Thank you.